Earlier, in command of submarine transport operations out of Rabaul, Harada had taken over the 33rd Base Force at Cebu. Midget submarines were something of a specialty with him. As CEO of IGN Chioda before the war, he oversaw their development and trained men to operate them. Forty-two men reported to Harada and commenced training. In December 1944, the midgets went out on many sorties, first being alerted by a lookout station on the northern tip of Mindanao whenever enemy ships were passing through the Philippines. One Koryu was lost and four damaged beyond further use in this effort, while Harada claimed the sinking of eleven cargo ships, four destroyers, two cruisers and one carrier. When the enemy took Cebu on Marm 28, 1945, the remaining Koryu were scuttled and their crews, together with the technicians, retreated to the mountains to fight on with army troops. Koryu were sent to Okinawa in January 1945, as were hundreds of Shinyo, the Toko motorboats. Also sent were nine Kaiten under Lieutenant of Fujio Kawai. These last never arrived. Pilots, crews and technicians were lost en route when the ship transporting them was sunk. When the enemy assaulted Okinawa, the 33rd Koryu group was there, with six midget subs and 130 men. Three midgets went out to attack enemy ships on Meerit 25. Only one returned, its captain reporting that he had hit an enemy ship with two torpedoes. The next day, two midgets went out, with one coming back, it reported hitting an American cruiser. This may actually have been the destroyer Halligan, which was torpedoed and sunk that day. Either the midget or RO-49, about which I speculated earlier in this chapter, got that ship. The Americans wiped out our nest of Shinyo, our Susid surface craft, when they landed on Keramareto, next to Okinawa, to set up artillery for shelling the larger island. The only other sorties by Koryu from Okinawa were made on Ma. 30, when one went out, and on April 5, when two went out. All three reported that they made no hits. By April 7, the enemy was on Okinawa in great force and closing in. The remaining Koryu were scuttled, and the 33rd Group Wireless Sixth Fleet that its members were joining army troops. Nothing was ever heard from them again. At home, submarine construction continued. I-373 was completed on April 14th at Yokosuka. She was destined to be our last submarine sunk. I-352 was launched at Kure on April 23rd, but was destined never to reach completion. And at Kure, the building of midgets went ahead so rapidly that at war's end we had a massive dry dock filled with them, almost ready to go. I-351 left Kure on May 1st for Singapore, under Latur Sidiata Noboru Okayama. She took out clothing, ammunition and aircraft spare parts, arriving May 15th. The enemy landed on Borneo that day, his aim being to cut us off from a great supply of oil that was so pure in its natural form that the combined fleet used to pipe it, without refining, directly into the bunkers of our warships. Germany surrendered early in May, and Japan found herself standing alone against the world. A one-ship Kaiten Sorte was made on May 5th when Lieutenant Kunio Taketomi left Otsujima with I-367. He launched one Kaiten bearing Petty Officer Masaaki Ono at the enemy, but no others. Upon returning to port June 3rd, he reported that two of his remaining Kaiten had suffered mechanical failure, one had rudder trouble, and the fifth suffered leakage into the pilot's chamber. This one-ship mission had the name Shimbu, made up of different ideographs than the name of the earlier Shimbu group. This latter designation translates into English as Advancement of the Samurai Way. On the day before I-351 arrived in Singapore, I gave over command of I-47 to Latur Sedector Masakichi Suzuki. The death of Sea Doctor Ankyu in RO 64 had left a gap in the ranks of combat experienced instructors at the submarine school, so I was transferred into his place. When I arrived at the school, on the north side of the Cure base, there were already two classes awaiting me. Each contained 30 officers. The HA class of submarines were being completed then, and these men had to be trained quickly. 
I took over the attack section of the school's curriculum, which covered most of the 15-week training course. Classroom sessions included lectures and blackboard illustrations in the theory and principles of submarine attack. They were followed by laboratory sessions, during which students trained on simulators and attack training devices. After that, I could take groups out in one of the training submarines moored nearby. I then conducted approach and attack exercises using small craft as practice target ships. All drills were repeated over and over again as each student took his turn at the duties he would have in a combat situation. Most of our operations were conducted in Hiroshima Bay. We also used Ionada Bay, near the western end of Shikoku Island in the Inland Sea, until enemy activity became so frequent that we even had to get out of the Inland Sea for a while. While I still had my first class of students under instruction, four more Kaiten-carrying boats went out. It was the Todoroki group. In Japanese, this means great roar, like the sound of a cannon. Two transport submarines, I-361 and I-363, joined with I-36 and an obsolescent boat, I-165, to make up this sortie. The last boat carried only two Kaiten and left port well after the other two ships had departed. One of them, in fact, had already been sunk by the time I-165 sailed. Let Masaharu Matsura took I-361 out of Kure for the Okinawa area on May 24, carrying five human torpedoes. She was never heard from again and was sunk on May 30 by aircraft from the escort carrier USS Anzio without, I think, ever firing either Kaiten or other torpedoes. As for I-363, Lita Sakai Kihara brought her back to port after 31 days at sea without a victory. He sighted enemy ships on several occasions, but I-363's sluggish 13-knot speed could not get him into position for making a launch. I-165 left Hikari on June 15th for a patrol east of the Marianas. We never heard from her again, but Japanese radio intelligence indicated to the 6th Fleet that she achieved good results before land-based aircraft from the Marianas downed her on June 27th. Liti Yasushi Ono commanded this ship. I-36 left Hikari on June 4th, carrying six Kaiten. She met an enemy convoy on June 24th, but when two successive Kaiten failed to operate, Sugamasa became disgusted. He fired a spread of conventional torpedoes, later reporting that he had hit a transport that seemed damaged at first, then quickly picked up speed and ran away. On June 28, Sugamasa launched one Kaiten at a transport or cargo ship, but was quickly pinned down by its counter-attacking escort. E-36 seemed doomed when two Katyn pilots volunteered to be launched against the prowling destroyers overhead. Although he wasn't sure Kaiten could be released from a depth of more than 200 feet, Sugamasa tried. His crew heard one loud explosion and several small ones, and I-36 was able to get away during the confusion. She claimed at least one destroyer for the day's action. Sugamasa's remaining Kaiten pilots had to return to port with him when their weapons failed to function. I-36 was certainly the Isamu, good luck, ship her crew had named her. She not only survived heavy damage from the depth charging she received on June 28th, but also just barely missed being sunk right in Bungo Strait on the way home. The American submarine gunnel fired four torpedoes at her shadowy shape in the blackness of July 6th, but they passed astern of her and exploded against the shoreline. The plan to bomb Washington and New York with planes from the massive I-400 class submarines was abandoned and replaced by one to bomb and torpedo the locks of Panama Canal. Only five of the proposed 18 giant boats were laid down. Construction of I-405 was halted in January 1945 when all emphasis was placed on smaller craft of the Toco type, so only four were left. By May, two of the big boats, I-400 and I-401, were ready. These, together with I-13 and I-14, were formed into Subron 1, under Capt Tatsunoke Ariizumi. But they could not yet go out to fight. The construction of special Seiran float aircraft for them had been delayed by bombings of the Aichi Aircraft Factory in Nagoya. Another delay was in providing pilots for these planes. The men trained at Kasumigaura, 
near Tokyo in other aircraft types, but had no practice in the kind of special operation intended. Then enemy B-29s took a hand, laying mines so thick in the inland sea that there was not even enough cleared area in which submarines could practice. In early June, just after I-351 got back from Singapore with 132,000 gallons of high-octane gasoline, some of our training submarines, plus the two giant boats, were ordered to proceed through Shimonoseki Strait to Anamizu Bay on the west coast of Honshu. I-13 and I-14 were to train at Ominato, near the very northern tip of Honshu. During this transfer of ships, we lost the old mine layer submarine I-122. A group of American submarines, a wolf pack nicknamed Heidemann's Hellcats, had slipped through Tsushima Strait in a daring move. They then operated in the Sea of Japan against the shipping between Korea and Honshu. One of them, USS Skate, put two torpedoes into Lulti Sosaku Mihara's boat and I-122 went down on June 10th, an event that put a damper on the good feelings I had at the time. HA-201 and HA-202 were completed at Sasebo on May 31st, and on the following day, I went to Tokyo with the 6th Fleet Chief of Staff, Captad Hankyu Sasaki. There, Admiral Soemu Toyoda, Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, heaped praise on me for my operations with Kaiten. He then presented me with a sword and the Medal of Merit, double. A Medal of Merit, single, was honour enough for any naval officer, so I was overwhelmed to receive the double. During the days following, naturally, I was in very high spirits. On June 5, a typhoon hit the American fleet off Okinawa, damaging 34 ships. Our kamikaze also struck it, damaging another five ships, but neither divine wind had an appreciable effect on the enemy's ability to wage war against us. Destroyers had already shelled Paramushiro, out of which our submarines operated against the Aleutians, and carrier-based aircraft were becoming a common sight in the skies over Kyushu. The enemy had started his campaign of attrition against our aircraft there in preparation for the invasion of Kyushu. With American submarines roaming about in the Sea of Japan, that area was no longer a safe place where young submariners could learn the arts of war. I took up duties at Otake, a base at the extreme western end of Hiroshima Prefecture, facing the inland sea. Until the war ended, we confined our training cruises to the swept waters just off Kuri, and we never dared take a boat into those, really, until the mine-sweeping command reported the area clear. On June 22nd, we lost two more of our dwindling force of submarines when B-29s showered their bombs on Kure. I-204 and I-352 were almost completed. Both were hit, and neither was completed by the time the war ended. For all practical purposes, the enemy had sunk these two submarines. On that same day, the Emperor held an imperial conference at which he told our top people that the war had to be ended. The Japanese people were suffering severely, he said, and could not endure much more hardship. Also, he added, he wanted the widespread destruction brought to a halt before Japan became weakened beyond the point of possible recovery. On that day, also, all organised Japanese resistance on Okinawa ended. My old teacher and inspiration, Latingena Mitsuru Ushijima, took his life in seppuku. More than 115,000 of his men had died in the 82-day struggle to beat back the enemy. On the next day, an imperial message went out, stating that the crisis for Japan was unprecedented. But die-hard army leaders overrode it with one of their own, urging all Japanese to continue the struggle until victory was won. They predicted that we would slay the enemy to the last man if he dared set foot upon our beloved homeland. One week later, the B-29s came over again, making a night firebombing raid on Kure. Two-thirds of the city and most of the great naval arsenal of which Japan was so proud were wiped out. More than 2,000 people died. I was then at Otake, but my family lived in Kure, and it was nearly 36 hours before I could get away from the base to search for my pregnant wife and our son. I found them, dazed, 
among the ruins of our house, from which wisps of smoke still rose. They had rushed to an air raid shelter when the alarm sounded, and so had suffered no physical injury. My heart sank when I saw the sadness in Hisako's eyes. This tender girl, whom I had first met when she was sixteen and I was twenty-three, was a picture of forlorn misery. Hisako's and my first confrontation had come as a surprise to me on January 7th, 1933. While home on leave that day, I was invited to accompany my mother and father to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Shigeru Ankyu. We were served by a very pretty girl wearing fumisoed, the special elaborately sleeved kimono worn only on formal occasions. Later, on the way home, my parents asked me what I thought of this girl, who had struck me as a very pretty, bright and well-mannered young lady. A surprised thought occurred to me. Was that our omiyai? I asked. My parents nodded, signifying that she was the girl they had chosen for my future wife. Next day, when I went to the train station to return to my ship, Hisako was there with her elder brother. His presence meant that she, in turn, approved of me. I thought of her often on board the battleship Mutsu, although I never mentioned her name to anyone. The China incident had begun just before my graduation from Etajima, and I felt that I could not ask a girl to share the life of a Navy man in those troubled times. We were at sea a great deal of the time when not studying hard in a service school, which left very little time for a family life. So I did not express my true feelings to Hisako for, it is difficult to believe, five more years. By then the incident had bloomed into a full-scale war. I had spent the intervening time at sea in the destroyer Kaki, submarines RO-27, I-55, I-7 and I-52, and the cruiser Nagara. Meanwhile, in spite of the hard life of a naval officer, my classmates were getting married one after another. So, in the summer of 1938, I made a formal application to the Navy Ministry for permission to get married. It was approved several months later and on February 11, 1939, anniversary day of the Japanese Empire's founding by Emperor Jimmu. Hisako and I were married at Chinde, Korea. I was then serving in the destroyer Shikinami. Five days later, my ship received sudden sailing orders. Because Russian patrol craft were harassing Japanese fishing boats off Vladivostok, Hisako later confessed that she wept all the time I was absent and was sorry to have married a naval officer. In May, I received orders to torpedo school at Yokosuka, so the journey there was our delayed honeymoon. After six months at Yokosuka, Hisako and I spent another five at Kure while I attended submarine school. That was the extent of our married life together until 1944, when I was ashore fitting out I-47. Now I was more or less ashore again, but under what awful conditions. After the raid on Kure, there was nothing I could do but take my wife and son back to Otake with me. Everything we owned had been destroyed in the bombing. We spent one night together at an inn. Then I found a room for Hisako and Shuchi at a farm. Leaving some money with her, I returned to the school. Eleven days later, while holding a night class, I was interrupted by a messenger bearing a note. Son born last night, it said. Mother and baby doing well. I got time off the next day, borrowed a bicycle, and pedalled it furiously over hilly roads for three hours. The roads were rough, and I was laden down with canned milk and some vegetables, which were very hard to obtain at that time. There, by Hisako's side, wrapped in white, lay our second son. He had been conceived while I was preparing to go out on the Congo mission, so I named him for it. In the tiny room of that lonely farm on a mountainside, I peered proudly into the infant's face and declared that his name would be Goichi, meaning first in strength. Con and go, steel, meant metal, strong. As I spoke the name of our second son, Hisako broke down, the first time she had done so since the early days of our marriage. When will this horrible war end? she cried at me. We have no home, no clothes, nothing. There was the little money you gave me, but I could buy practically nothing with it. 
It took much searching in the black market just to find enough to keep us alive. You, my husband, are a naval officer. You must fight. It is your duty. But I have no willingness to struggle any more. Nor does anyone else. No one believes that Japan will defeat the enemy when he comes to our shores, no matter what the newspapers or radio say. Our land will be reduced to ashes and your sons and I with it. Our only choice will be dying under bombs or through starvation. I tried to comfort my wife, but what could I do? What could I say? My heart was breaking in two. There was my family to consider, but also my duty. I was a naval officer sworn to defend all wives and children of Japan, not just my own. To do less was to be a coward, a shirker. I calmed Hisako as best I could, left the food and some more money with her, promised to get more, then returned to the school. There I hurled myself into my tasks, impelled by a great desire for revenge. I had only one real weapon, my experience. If I could pass some of this to my students, they could better face the enemy. The next few weeks were a frenzy of work for me, broken sharply by an incident that occurred near the end of the month. I had set out early in the morning for the western end of the inland sea, as tactical officer in command of four training submarines and one target boat. Litakota Iwao Teramoto, who had I-36 during the Kikusui and Congo sorties, was an instructor with me at the school. He was on board the target boat. Between us, we were to direct the exercises. I would supervise the students in their approach and attack techniques, and Teramoto would judge and criticise the results. In the afternoon, we would exchange positions and duties. Training started early in the morning. In the middle of the second approach run, the wireless operator on the submarine I was riding handed up an air raid warning message. I signalled all submarines to dive at once and the target boat to run for a sheltered cove along the shoreline. It didn't get there in time, though. Through the periscope, I watched the Grumman fighters peel off, dive and open fire on Terramoto's craft with rockets and machine guns. I could not help him, of course, but the lone 13 million machine gun on his boat kept up a steady fire. Still, it was clear that the target boat did not have a chance. All of a sudden, I saw flame flare from its engine spaces. When the Grummans flew away, I surfaced and went alongside. No one was visible on deck as we approached, and my boarding party found several men lying about, seriously wounded. Eight others were dead. Terramoto was one of them. As he stood at his post on the bridge, Three bullets had pierced him. How strange was fate. Had the attack come a few hours later, I would have been standing in his place. Again, the fortunate Arita had escaped death. No wonder the I-47 crew had thought me a lucky captain and named their ship Never Die. The 8th Kaiten sortie began departures on July 14th, led by Lieutenant C. Katosaichi Oba's I-53. He had the first of six boats in the Tamon group, so called after the youth name of Masashige Kusunoki's son, the name he used until adulthood. Oba had six kaiten on board, of which two failed to function. One of the others, so far as I can tell, sank the US destroyer escort, Underhill. I-53 got back to port 29 days later with a report of successes. Litsidata Hashimoto took I-58 out from Hirao two days after I-53 left a false start that had to be repeated. My former ship, I-47, left Hikari on July 19th, found no enemy ships, and came back on Augaosa. Eleven without firing Kai-10. I-367 brought her five Kai-10 back on Aug. Sixteen after 28 days at sea. Liltakunio Takatomi had also not found the enemy. The fifth boat, I-366, left Hikari on Aug. One, she was back on Aug. Sixteen, three Kai-10 expended, two inoperative. On Aug, 9, Lertan Takami Tokioka was detected by a group of enemy warships. When attacked, I-366 launched three Kaiten, bearing Latetiu, JG, Kenji Narus, Petty Officer Tokue Wenishi, and Petty Officer Hajime Sano. Although Sixth Fleet thought that those Kaitens sank three large transports, Americans credit the destroyer escort Johnny Hutchins with sinking all three of these human torpedoes. 
investigation showed that there were no large transports in that area at that time, only a large group of enemy destroyer escorts bent on killing off any Japanese submersible encountered. The last of the Taman boats, I-363, was at sea for only eight days. Lati Sakai Kihara left Hikari on Aug 8, heading for waters east of Okinawa. He was soon diverted into the Sea of Japan, was strafed by enemy planes en route there, then was recalled to Kura. Our underseas aircraft carriers, meanwhile, had gone out on a sortie. I-400 and I-401, after much delay, had finally received their aircraft. I-401 was under Sea Dr. Shinsei Nambu, later an officer in Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force. Sea Dr. Utsunosuke Kusaka had I-400. These submarines dwarfed the USS Argonaut and the French Surcouf, considered the world's largest submarines until the existence of ours was revealed after the war. Although somewhat unwieldy because of their size, both boats could crash dive to periscope depth in 56 seconds, considered quite an achievement. There was not enough fuel available in the Cura area for the two giant boats to obtain a full load, so in mid-April they started for Dairin, Manchuria, to take on fuel. After that, they were supposed to go to the Inland Sea and start training pilots. I-401 hit an American-laid mine off Himejima, Kyushu, and had to put back into Kura for repairs, but I-400 made the round trip without incident. While his I-401 was being repaired, captors, Arizumi took advantage of the delay to get Schnorkel installed. I-13 and I-14 also received them. Then, in June, they started for the Inland Sea again. It was a chilling experience, passing through Shimonoseki Strait, said Kapto, Nambu long after the war. The masts of sunken ships looked like a forest of ghostly trees. Some ships had capsized in shallow water, and their bottoms had a red rusty colour. It was a tense passage. I was worried all the time. I-401 had an anti-magnetic apparatus installed in her, but there were other types of mines that could sink us. All hands breathed a big sigh of relief when the journey was completed. At Nanao Bay, more delay followed, due to difficulty in training pilots. They had to make catapult takeoffs and water landings, then manoeuvre skillfully on the surface for pickup by the foldaway crane each big boat had on its deck, one plane crashed at sea and was lost. Another slammed into a mountainside. They had to be replaced and new pilots trained. Forced landings at sea were another hazard, because each time its submarine had to go out and pick up both pilot and plane. According to Nambu, it was a rare moment when I-401 had all three of its planes on board and in good condition. We worked hard, though, he said and once we're able to surface, unstow three aircraft and get them away, all in 45 minutes. It was the only time, however, that we did have three planes ready for such a drill. It was at about this time that Captain Ot Ariazumi proposed the destruction of the Panama Canal, saying that it would delay the arrival of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet in Pacific waters for at least three months. Since Germany had surrendered, we could expect that fleet to join the U.S. Pacific Fleet against us. Life-sized models of the Panama Canal locks were built at Maizuru and towed to Nanao Bay. Attack drills were conducted and a sortie date set. The boats were to head east on just about the same course our first air fleet had taken on its way to attack Pearl Harbor in 1941. Once past Oahu, the giant submarines were to turn south and head in that direction until they were on the same latitude as Colombia in South America. Then they were to turn east, run for the South American coastline, and, hugging it, creep northward until within air range of the Panama Canal. Ten aircraft would then be launched, each carrying either a 1760 LB, bomb or a torpedo. A light force guarded the Panama Canal, since both the great expanses of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans were now in Allied hands. It was believed that not only would surprise be achieved, but the planes recovered as well. Captor Ariazumi suggested this plan when the one to bomb Washington and New York was scrapped. He was infuriated when it, in turn, was scrapped in favour of an attack on Ulithi, 
where I had launched Kaiten eight months before. The Ulithi assault was to be a combination aircraft Kaiten attack, with the airstrike force reduced from ten to six planes, all to take Toko dives. I-13 and I-14 would not be launching aircraft from sea against Ulithi. Instead, they would sortie from Maizuru to Truk, each carrying two long-range Seyun scout aircraft, crated. These planes were to be reassembled at our bypassed outpost, then make a swift reconnaissance flight over Ulithi. Meanwhile, I-400 and I-401 were to rendezvous in mid-ocean, receive the necessary information by radio, and launch six aircraft at Ulithi. K-10 carrying submarines lurking just outside Ulithi's reef would attack at the same time. Capcho Ariazumi fought this change of plans. He wanted to hit the enemy as powerful a blow as possible and felt that destruction of the Panama Canal would achieve more lasting damage. The naval general staff did not agree. Its members pointed out that enemy ships were already coming from the Indian Ocean and more from European waters were coming via the Suez Canal. Troops were being diverted from other war fronts too. Ulithi was an important staging point for these troops, which would soon be employed against our homeland. Damage done to the Panama Canal could not defeat what was already in Oriental waters. A man does not worry about a fire he sees on the horizon, staff members told Ariazumi, when other flames are licking at his kimono sleeve. They insisted on his striking at Ulithi. He had to accept this third plan. I-13 and I-14 sorted through Tsuguru Strait on July 2nd. I-13 was not heard from again. The destroyer escort Taylor and planes from USS Anzio are supposed to have sunk her on July 16th, east of Honshu, but I don't think that is possible. The site of the alleged sinking is nowhere near where I-13 was scheduled to be at that time. Perhaps Taylor and the aircraft attacked one of our HA-101 class boats, some of which patrolled that area, manned by young officers who were disgruntled at having mere picket duty without weapons. Some of these young captains had appealed to captors Hanku Sasaki, asking at least that they be equipped with demolition charges so that they could ram oncoming enemy ships. Their suggestion was still being considered when the war ended, so, as in other cases, there probably was an American pilot somewhere at the war's end, wondering why he did not get credit for sinking a submarine. I believe I-13 either fell victim to one of the many air patrols with which the Americans were then darkening the skies, or sank through accident. In any case, she did not arrive at truck on July 14th as scheduled. I-14 did, and unloaded her two crowded aircraft, I-400 and I-401 followed these submarines out later, parting company soon after clearing home waters on Captain Ariazumi's orders. Each was ordered to proceed independently to a rendezvous point south of Ponape in the Carolines, arriving on station Aug. 12. There they would await word of the attack date. To camouflage the group's mission and to make sure both submarines were not found together, Captain E. Ariizumi told Sea Doctor Nambu, captain of the flagship in which Ariizumi was riding, I-401, to take his boat on a long swing east of the marshals. Then they ran southward a great distance before turning westward and then toward the Carolines. Both ships had excellent radar, effective up to 60 miles. It was felt that they were not likely to be surprised and sunk, as had happened to so many Japanese submarines in 1944 and 1945. Before the rendezvous day, however, two other important dates arrived. One was July 29th, when Lutej Sidiota Mochitsura Hashimoto initiated a strange series of events by torpedoing and sinking the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis. And the other was Og. Six ever since known at Hiroshima as the Day of Defeat, a new career, my final service. On July 2nd, the American submarine Barb used a new weapon for submarines, rockets, against targets in the Japanese homeland. Three days later, General MacArthur announced that the Philippines had been formally liberated from Japan. On the next day, I-351 arrived at Singapore, 
This was Leto Suda, Noboru Okayama's second fuel run there. He took aboard 500 kilolitres of aviation gasoline, as before, and started for home on July 11th. Three days later, I-351 and all her crew were scorched into eternity. Torpedoes from the American submarine Bluefish tore into her, and the transport converted to tanker blew up. Next day, a force of enemy surface ships shelled our northern island, Hokkaido. The net was closing. On July 15th, the 6th Fleet added six submarines to its roster, but only on paper. They were the German submarines U-181, U-862, UIT-24, UIT-25, U-219 and U-195. The first two were confiscated at Singapore, the next pair at Kobe, and the others at Jakarta and Soerabaya, respectively. We renamed them I-501 through I-506. All were out of service when we confiscated them from our surrendered ally, and still undergoing refit when the war ended. On July 16th, the world's first atomic bomb was exploded successfully at Almogordo, New Mexico, in the US. On the same day, USS Indianapolis, which had been waiting for word of this, left San Francisco for Tinian, carrying a special cargo of uranium. Battleships and cruisers were shelling our main island of Honshu not long after that. On July 16th and 18th, enemy carrier planes swept, one wave after another, over the Kanto Plain. Described to Mr Harrington by a Yokosuka resident as filling the sky in every direction you looked, they hit Tokyo, Yokohama, Yokosuka and the nearby airfields defending our capital city. I-372, which Shingo Takahashi commanded, was getting ready for a sortie at Yokosuka and was sunk in the July 18th raid, all hands miraculously surviving the bomb hit that sent her down. Just before and after I-372's loss, however, we scored two minor victories. I-53 sent a K-10 into the attack transport USS Marathon on July 12th, damaging her, then sent another into the destroyer escort Underbill on July 24th. Lit Cadeta Ober hit Underhill right in the middle of an attack on him. Underhill was so badly damaged that she had to be sunk by friendly forces. Carrier aircraft hit Kure on July 23rd, 24. When they flew back over the horizon, Japan had practically no navy left. Battleships Hayuga, Ys and Lucky Haruna the ship Americans claimed to have sunk about as often we claimed to have sunk USS Saratoga, settled right at their moorings, only portions of their superstructures thrusting above the surface. That left Japan with only one of her twelve battleships remaining, EJN Nagato, and she was damaged. Also, while those carrier planes were hitting Kure, Japan was being invaded by submariners. A party of Americans had paddled ashore from USS Barb at Carafuto and blew up a railroad train. I-402 was completed at Sasebo on July 24th. Neither she nor her sister, I-404, saw action. The war was over before I-402 completed her shakedown training and I-404 was sunk by bombing at Cure on July 28th. She was moored offshore awaiting completion when carrier planes swooped in to give our navy its final blow. Carrier Amagi, ancient cruiser Izumo, light cruiser Oyodo and destroyer Nashi went to a watery grave with I-404. Meanwhile, in I-58, Lieutenant Sidiata Hashimoto had cruised for a week without sighting anything. On July 28th, he spotted a tanker and a few minutes later a distant explosion was heard. I-58 surfaced for a look, but a rain squall obscured vision in all directions. Hashimoto dived his sub again, estimating there was a very dim possibility that he had sunk a tanker. At that moment in time, in spite of duty in a total of five submarines since the war's beginning, Hashimoto had yet to fire a conventional torpedo at the enemy. The following night, he scored Japan's last success of the war. A messenger waked me as I had ordered at 10.30pm. He said, the moon had then been risen for 30 minutes. Hashimoto threw some water on his face, then stopped for a few moments of meditation at his ship's shrine. This, a 10x16 box of white paulonia wood installed by workers at Cure, contained a few mementos and charms from Ise Grand Shrine, 
where the emperor's goddess ancestor, Amaterasu, is venerated. Then Hashimoto went to the conning tower, accepted a routine report from his watch officer, and assumed the con. Night action stations, he ordered, and took I-58 up from the depths to where he could scan with his periscope. He also ordered the air and surface search radar antennas elevated, and when nothing could be detected either visually or electronically, called out, surface. I-58 had hardly iconic to rest when one of her lookouts reported seeing a ship 90 degrees left of the bow. Hashimoto was then steering almost directly south. The sighting was to the east. Hashimoto said he heaved his thick body up the ladder to the bridge to confirm the sighting personally and issued a rapid series of orders. Dive! Level off at 60 feet! Man all Caton! Make ready all torpedo tubes! The enemy ship, which had been a black blob on the eastern horizon, slowly took on a triangular shape. Hashimoto began to make out a large ship with a high superstructure. It was either a battleship or a cruiser. As it kept ploughing through the sea toward him, neither changing speed nor appearing to zigzag, he kept saying to himself, That ship is dead. That ship is dead. All six of I-58's tubes were loaded and readied, at which point Hashimoto grew fearful that the enemy vessel might pass too close to him for his torpedoes to arm. Like Tanabe approaching USS Yorktown at Midway, Hashimoto needed to make sure the run from his tubes to the target would be long enough for his torpedoes to arm themselves, which they did after a specific number of propeller revolutions. He quickly ordered a hundred de turn made to the left, then he ordered another to the right. This long S-turn put him back on his original course, but along a path more to the east and somewhat more distant from the enemy's track than he had been earlier. The cruiser or battleship was now about 2.5 miles away, angling across I-58's bow from the left. Hashimoto could now make out her two towering islands clearly, as well as her turrets. He decided, because of her high freeboard, that she was an Idaho-class battleship. The four Kaiten men were in their weapons, all clamouring to be fired away, now that the size of the target had been announced. Hashimoto curtly told his torpedo officer, Lita Toshio Tanaka, that the Kaiten men could wait. He had a perfect firing setup now, and was waiting only for the range to shorten a little more before emptying his tubes at the target. If he took time to launch Kaiten, the target might pass and be gone into the night. Also, launching human torpedoes was a noisy operation that might be picked up on enemy sound equipment, and the visibility had begun to vary. Kaiten pilots might not be able to see a thing through their short periscopes. When the enemy ship was about 1,500 yards away, and I-58 on a line 60 degrees off his starboard bow, Hashimoto shouted, Fire one! In quick succession, a half-dozen Model 95s leaped from their tubes, spaced three degrees apart, set to run at 19 feet. Three missed, running across the enemy ship's bow. Then, one after another, the other three hit. The first slammed into the bow, and the second hit under the first turret. The final torpedo struck under the bridge, according to Hashimoto's report, he could see a third column of water in the light of explosions caused by his first two hits. I-58's torpedo officer, gunnery officer and two communications petty officers kept scrambling for turns at the day periscope while Hashimoto was using the night one. Their cries of joy were repeated throughout the submarine. Hashimoto kept sweeping the horizon with his periscope. He could not believe that so big a ship was travelling without escorts, and recalled the time off the marshals when a line of destroyers appeared out of nowhere while he was working into position to torpedo two aircraft carriers and a battleship. After a short while he dived his boat and turned to the westward, to keep clear of any escorts while his torpedo tubes were reloaded. An hour later he was back on the surface, sweeping the area with both radar and binoculars, the radar showed nothing, and the visibility had closed down to 100 yards. Hashimoto wirelessed Kure, saying, Have just torpedoed and sunk Idaho-class battleship. Then he turned north and made full speed for several hours on the surface, 
getting as far away as possible before diving again. On Aug 10, the captain of I-58 launched two more Kai-10 at enemy ships, with results doubtful. On Aug 12, the last Kai-10 of the war was fired. Hashimoto had two remaining, but Petty Officer Ichiro Shirakis was found defective. The other, manned by Petty Officer Yoshiaki Hayashi, was sent away at what Hashimoto thought was a large seaplane tender. Actually, it was the dock landing ship USS Oak Hill. Hayashi may have actually scraped this target side with his katen, but he did not sink it. Destroyer escort Nickel, trying to locate the human torpedo, saw it explode about a mile astern of Oak Hill. Hashimoto had set out on July 16th, but had had to put about and return when several Kaiten periscopes were found to be defective. A week after he left this second time, Japan received word of the Potsdam Declaration, which demanded unconditional surrender from Japan. To some of our high-ranking officers, this was unthinkable. A group of them, later called Kichigai, the insane ones, plotted to seize rule of Japan. They claimed that this would foil the Badoglio-type statesmen surrounding the emperor, who, they said, were acting like the officer who had surrendered Italy to the Allies. Jenna Korechika Anami, Minister of War, was the leader of this no-surrender faction. His followers went so far as to forge an order giving them command of the Imperial Palace Guard, then searched the emperor's residence on the night of Orgoris. 14. Trying to find the phonograph record of the surrender announcement the Emperor had made for broadcast the next day. Posters suddenly appeared everywhere, denouncing the Emperor's closest advisers as traitors and urging people to provide themselves with bamboo spears for repelling expected Allied paratroopers. Manichi, one of our larger national newspapers, carried announcements of government orders that indolent workers would be punished and showed pictures of large underground factories being constructed. Workers, fearing bombs, had not been reporting for work at industrial defence plants, so threats of fines and imprisonment were used against them. Absenteeism had become a civil crime. Then came Aug. 6. The day when two sons, one natural and the other man-made, cast their fiery glow over Hiroshima, not very far from my place of duty. An air raid warning sounded at 8am at Otake, but I did not pay much attention to it. There often were false alarms, and the radio at the time was reporting that only one lone B-29 had been sighted in the sky. I had gathered up my books and was about to head for my classroom when, at about 8.15am, a terrific explosion was heard. A short time later, all the windows on the north side of my building were blown in by an air blast, the great pressure wave emanating from where an atomic bomb was first dropped on human beings. I looked toward Hiroshima. A large cloud was spreading over the city. It then seemed to zoom upward with ever-increasing speed, after which it topped off at a great height, giving it the appearance of a giant mushroom. Atomic bomb! I don't think I spoke the words aloud, but know that I spoke them in my mind. I had heard from time to time that Japan's scientists were studying how to make atomic bombs, and the matter had been brought up for discussion in the National Diet during 1942. At once I realised that America had perfected her bomb first. Two other things came into my mind at the same moment. My family was safe, but the war was lost. Should America continue to drop bombs like that one, Japan was truly doomed. I went on to my classroom, but had difficulty concentrating on the curriculum. What is the purpose of what I am doing? One asked myself. There I was, teaching students how to make a submarine attack, when B-29s were spreading mines so thickly that even Japan's fishing fleet was decimated and could not bring food to our people. Submarines had difficulty clearing Kure, letting alone reaching and hitting the enemy. They had to pass through Bungo Strait submerged, out of fear of lurking enemy boats. And America had the atomic weapon. What chance was there for victory? Whenever my glance moved in the direction of Hiroshima that day, one was thankful that none of my family, relatives or friends lived there. 
On Agra 7, with several other submarine school instructors, I drove into Hiroshima. We were curious to see the effects of an atomic weapon. So small was our knowledge of it that we didn't even know about danger from radiation and rode blithely into what would be later called the danger area. Horrific sights met our eyes. Everywhere there was desolation. All that remained standing of Hiroshima's structures were the shells of concrete buildings. Everything else was flattened over a wide radius from the explosion's centre. Fires were still smoking, and charred bodies of men, women, children and horses lay everywhere. A few live people, haggard-eyed, wandered about poking through the wreckage, trying to find the remains of lost ones. A sickening stench rose from everything. We soon realised that this was no time for satisfying scientific curiosity, and, after offering a few of the more wretched ones our condolences, we got back into our car and returned to Otake. No one spoke during the ride back, but I am sure that my comrades had the same thoughts as I, Radar, blockade, bombs, fire raids, and now this. No doubt of it, the end could not be far off. On Augunto 8. A second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and Russia declared war upon Japan. The first was expected sooner or later, and the second surprised no military man. For 40 years the Russians had been waiting for an opportunity to take revenge, ever since our military and naval forces had smashed them at Port Arthur and Tsushima Strait. Few of the world's white men, other than diplomats, historians and political scientists, are aware of how much that defeat rankled, especially since it had been achieved less than 40 years after Japan had emerged from a supposedly barbarian state. The world's coloured peoples are aware of it, however. One need only discuss history for a few minutes with leaders of any backward nation, before learning that scholars from such nations mark the Russo-Japanese War of 1905 as a tide-turning, the first time in history that a coloured race defeated a white one. Every Japanese military man was constantly aware of the great bear at our backs, ready to pounce should we ever grow weak. In class that day, I told my students that we should fight on for Japan so long as breath was left in us. In Tokyo, the emperor was telling an imperial conference that the time has come to bear the unbearable. Liti Sida Yukio Inaba took I-373 out of Sasebo on Aug, 9, heading for Formosa. Four days later, the US submarine Spikefish torpedoed and sank her, the 134th and last Japanese submarine destroyed or sunk in the war. Early in the morning of Aug, 10, our emperor demanded the unanimous consent of his closest adversaries for accepting the terms of the Potsdam Declaration. Japan, he said, must surrender unconditionally. There would be no more quibbling. And, on the next day, the American Secretary of State announced that, from the moment of surrender, our emperor would be subject to the orders of the Supreme Allied Commander in the Pacific. This was Jenner Douglas MacArthur, who later thwarted Russian attempts to seize Japan by simply ignoring whatever the Russians requested or said. Not knowing what else to do, I continued my submarine classes. At Otake we had no knowledge of what was occurring in Tokyo, the plots, the promises, the planned revolts. Then, at 7.15am on Auseg 15, we heard over the radio that the Emperor would speak to all of his subjects at noon. It was something that had never happened before his majesty's voice coming to all Japanese at the same time. We didn't know what to make of it, except that something of great and special importance was bound to be said. By that time, bomb damage had hurt Japan so badly that electrical power was rationed. It required a special allotment of electricity to bring off the broadcast. When the appointed time arrived, I gathered with other Otake officers and men in front of our main building, where loudspeakers had been set up. Vice Adm. Noboru Ichikawa stood facing us. None of us had any idea what was coming. I expected the Emperor either to issue an imperial order or make a personal appeal for all Japanese to unite in one final stand against the enemy. There was a lot of static in the broadcast, making it difficult to hear, and every account I have read since states that this was interference caused by unknown persons who were trying to jam the broadcast. 
Nevertheless, all of us could make out enough of it to understand that the Emperor was telling us that he meant to end the war. Earlier, while some of us were still in the school instructor's office, Latindakursta Genbei Kawaguchi, former skipper of I-44, had burst through the door. In an agitated voice, he said that advisers to the Emperor had told our ruler lies about the true state of Japan and overseas. He claimed that the Emperor, misled, was about to make an announcement of surrender. This was appalling news to all of us. How Kawaguchi received the word in advance, I do not know. Perhaps he had been told by representatives of the army officers in Tokyo who were planning the coup d'etat. They hoped to seize control of the empire, fight on, then turn control back to the emperor after winning the great victory they were sure they could bring off. We became confused upon listening to Kawaguchi. The confusion increased when we later heard the emperor's broadcast. Some wanted to fight on, including myself. But a few, again including myself, also began to think of our duty to the Emperor. He said that he was going to end the war and that made us bound to assist him to carry out whatever orders were given toward that end. Nonetheless, August 15, 1945, was a day of insanity. No voice of reason could be heard. Anyone who dared mention the word surrender would have been fighting his own comrades for his life. After a lot of speculation, I and others took refuge in indecision. We decided to wait until some kind of official word was sent down through Sixth Fleet from the Naval General Staff. Meanwhile, business as usual, we returned to our classrooms. The next day, Gecko night fighter aircraft from the nearby airbase at Iwakuni flew over Otake, dropping handbills. Each bore a message from Captain E. Yasuna Ozono. He was at the airbase in Atsugi, southwest of Tokyo, and commander of the aircraft charged with defence of our capital city. Ozono refused to surrender. He had sent men to other bases, too, to take over planes from those men who were surrendering. His leaflets urged all of us to fight on with him to a certain victory. Only a small minority at Otake were influenced by Ozono's message. The time between the Emperor's broadcast and the dropping of the leaflets had given us a chance to think. At Hirao, Lata Takesuka Tateyama, determined to fight on, took the old I-159 out with a pair of kaiten and headed for the inland sea. But he came back in two days. On Aug. 17, I was ordered by Rear Adam, Mitsuru Nagai to take over as disciplinary commander at Otake. You will be responsible, he said, for calming the wild spirits of young submarine men and students, it will not be easy. You know that their spirit is the highest in the Imperial Navy. They will not want to give up. My duties also included the burning of all official records and documents, and I also had to see to it that submarine men were released from active duty. I also had to see to the discharge of all civilian workers without incident. These were not easy tasks. Many men and women had worked long and hard in hope of a Japanese victory. Telling them that all was lost and they would no longer be needed was a hard thing to do. I had to calm many people, soothe many disturbed feelings. Hashimoto got back to Kure with his I-58 on Ug. 18. On the way up Bungo Strait, he'd met six HA-class submarines that had left Kure, their captains determined to fight to the death. Hashimoto, having already received the Emperor's broadcast on his radio, was reserving decision and action until he arrived in port. When his boat glided on past them, the six Hay-class boats put about and also returned. Hashimoto reported that I-58 had sunk a battleship. He found a very tense situation at the Kure anchorage. Submariners had earlier provisioned and fueled every boat there. A delegation of young officers, led by Latura Kira Kikuchi, met with Captain Shojiro Yura of the 6th Fleet Staff and asked him to convince senior officers to keep on fighting. Yura disagreed, risking his life, and reminded those men of their duty to the Emperor. The delegation left, but a few submarine captains tried to change Ayura's mind. Let them go, they urged. Those men do not want to live. 
they can fight the enemy for as long as two more months before committing seppuku. They wish to die in battle, like true samurai. Why not let them do it? Again, Yura demurred, and it was about that time that the six HA boat commanders took matters into their own hands and headed down Bungo Strait. When a third group came to him in the afternoon of Augmas 18, Yura went to Vice Admace, Daigo that evening, and Daigo summoned all concerned to his headquarters the next day. For nearly three years, he told them, I had official duty that put me in close attendance on our Emperor. I know what he is like. I understand his feelings. You men obviously do not understand them. He is very humane, very concerned for all of his people, not just us few in the military forces. If we continue to fight, the enemy will continue to fight. And what will happen? Many thousands of innocent ones, women and children, will die because you are so headstrong. If you sink even one enemy ship, death will shower down on the innocents who have no weapons at all. Think. Try to understand the deep sense of humanity that made the Emperor come to this precedent-shattering decision. Dago's words were enough. All present apologised and begged his forgiveness for causing him and the Emperor concern. They promised to make no more trouble. That ended the problem at Kure. Expect for an occasional raised voice. Disbanding of the forces there went ahead with no difficulty. Disturbances occurred among submariners at Yokosuka, Maizuru, Sasebo, and the places where Toko Squadron 11 and positioned Kaiten, Koryu, and Shinyo. But everyone eventually calmed down alter a few days. Men began to think about their families, left alone to face an occupation by the enemy. They began drifting away from Otake and other bases, toward their homes. As for Tokyo, Genotus Anami committed suicide, and one version has it that at Atsugi, Captor Ozono was given a hypodermic by peace-inclined people, then spirited away. The Japanese government itself later tried him, sent him to prison and did not include him years later, after the occupation ended, on the list when pensions were given to former military men. Prince Takamatsu, the emperor's brother, helped put things right at Atsugi, where holes were punched in fuel tanks and propellers removed from aircraft, so that the Kichigai could not use them in kamikaze attacks on the approaching Allied fleet. Everything was settled before General MacArthur's advance party landed at Atsugi. One Japanese officer had an amusing experience that illustrates how rapidly the mood of the country changed. Right after the surrender, he met an elderly farmer who was brandishing an ancient rusty sword and threatening to slaughter all Americans. On Augu. 22, that officer met the farmer again. This time the sword was dripping blood. Have you been fighting, Oji-san? The officer asked. No, the old man answered. Just killing a pig. I was hungry. The pragmatic had overwhelmed the heroic. All through Japan, people supported the emperor's position, a proof of the reverence in which he was held. After announcing the surrender of Japan, the US announced the loss of the cruiser Indianapolis. Later events showed this sinking to be the centre of a tragedy in communications. When Hashimoto's torpedoes sent the cruiser down, about 300 men died. But twice that many later died, because no rescuers came to their aid for four days. Overconfident from so many victories, the American authorities did not set up any regulation, at least in the Philippines, for action to be taken should a scheduled vessel not arrive by her designated time. The Philippines were where Indianapolis was heading when she was sunk. No search was made until an aircraft sighted some survivors in the water several days after the ship went down. The delay cost about 600 lives through exposure, exhaustion, sharks and thirst. An even stranger sequel followed. Late in 1945, Hashimoto, then involved in clearing up the debris of war, was suddenly seized by occupation authorities and taken to America. There he appeared as a witness in the general court-martial of the officer, Capt. Charles McVeigh, USN, whose ship he had sunk. I do not think that such a happening has any precedent in history, summoning your enemy to testify against your own fighting men. 
Hashimoto, puzzled, answered the questions put to him. Later, while translating Mr. Richard Newcomb's book on the Indianapolis sinking into Japanese, Hashimoto realised that some of his testimony had been very poorly translated. Long afterward, he still held a low opinion of the entire proceedings. On Ogata 19, I received a letter from Hisako, telling me she was taking our sons and going back to Kagoshima. This was a bold thing for a Japanese wife to do without consulting her husband, but a brave thing as well. I had my hands full where I was, urging men to go home and arranging things for a swift takeover by occupation troops when they arrived. On September 15th, the 6th Fleet was finally disbanded, one of vice, Adam. Daigo's final official acts being to promote me and other officers. I became a commander in a navy that no longer existed and was mustered out in October. When I left, I said goodbye to the scraps of a great navy, a navy that had really been my life since I was a small boy. Of our once mighty fleet, we had lost 11 battleships, 21 aircraft carriers, 38 cruisers, 135 destroyers, and via one means or another, 134 submarines. Eight of the submarines had been lost in Khitan operations, together with 80 of the young men who had volunteered to serve as human torpedoes. Another 15 Khitan men had died in training accidents, suffocating, drowning, or striking enemy-laid mines. About 10,000 trained submarine men had died fighting for Japan. And after a few ships had been taken by the victors, the Allies took the remainder out to sea in February 1946, scuttling them in Operation Road's End, the Imperial Navy's final humiliation. As I made my way southward towards home, I found the country in a terrible state. Japan was unable to feed or clothe itself, nor was the population able to sustain good health. Medicines were in such short supply. Had not occupation authorities rushed in massive shipments of food, much of Japan's population would not have survived the winter of 1945. One out of every five dwellings in the country had been destroyed by bombs or fire, or had been torn down to help create fire breaks. Nearly 30 million persons had been affected by this. The lucky ones were crowded in with relatives, the rest were huddled in shacks made of whatever they could scavenge. On my arrival in Kagoshima, my brother-in-law, Kiyoshi Anraku, provided us with a house. This was most kind of him, because we were penniless. He also offered me a job in his sake brewing business. But I felt I knew the sea best, so instead one took a job with a small shipping company that had managed to salvage a few light cargo carriers out of the war. But everything, including fuel oil, was in short supply during those days and for a long time afterward, and my earnings could not keep place with the inflation that hit Japan. So, after four very difficult years, I finally gave up and went to work with my brother-in-law. While still with the shipping company, I had been summoned to Yokohama by the occupation authorities. A military tribunal was sitting there, investigating what is known as the Ichioka case. Vice Adi M. Hisao Ichioka had commanded Subron 8 in the Indian Ocean, and the Allies were charging that atrocities had been committed by Japanese submariners in that area during the period from March 1, 1943, to Aogu. 31, 1944. Beginning in November 1945, about 200 former officers and men of our submarine force were interrogated. The Allies charged that the rules of war had been violated. They said that enlisted men, officers, submarine captains and higher officers had intentionally carried out or had allowed to be carried out without interference, inhumane acts against survivors of sunken ships. Former members of our Penang garrison were also charged with maltreatment of prisoners of war, Subdiv 14, I-26, I-27, I-29 and I-37, and Subdiv 30, I-162, I-165 and I-166, plus I-8 and 7-70 to were supposed to have been involved. As a result of the interrogations, some men were arrested and the others allowed to go home. A Nisei interpreter questioned me closely for about six hours, but since there were no charges of such offences occurring in the Pacific area, I was released. In January 1949, sentences were handed down. Ichioka, who had both subdivs in his Subron 8, 
received 20 years at hard labour. Vice Admes Teruhisa Komatsu, who commanded 6th Fleet for part of that period, was sentenced to 15 years. Rear Adam Noboru Ichizaki received 10 years, while Rear Adam Hisashi Mito received 8 years. Capt Shojiro Yura, whom I have mentioned in this book a number of times, had been Ichizaki's chief staff officer for a while. He was sentenced to six years. Capt Nobuyaki Tadaki, commander of the Penang base, received ten years. Sea Doctor Hajime Nakagawa, who had been CO of I-37, received eight years. Sea Doctor Toshio Kusaka of I-26, five years. Two officers from I-8, Lieutenant Sadao Motonaka and Latter Masanori Hattori, received seven and five years, respectively. Five others received prison terms of one to two years, and 26 men were found innocent. All the convicted were sent to Sugamo Prison in Tokyo, sentenced to hard labour with other war criminals. Six years later, all sentences were commuted and all men released on probation under Japanese laws. Vice Adiem. Tadashige Daigo was executed as a war criminal, in what I know to be a terrible miscarriage of justice. After following orders to disband the Sixth Fleet and turn everything over to the occupation authorities, Daigo retired to his home. There he was suddenly arrested in December 1946. He was tried by the Dutch, who lusted for revenge after the humiliating and speedy defeat we had inflicted on them in 1941-42. Daigo was tried, convicted and sentenced and executed for a crime of which he had had absolutely no knowledge whatever. The incident occurred in Daigo's command, but at Pontianak, Borneo, while Daigo was all the way across on the other side of Borneo at Balikpapan, commanding the 22nd Base Force. Daigo's tenure was from November 1943 to August 1944. During that time, some natives at Pontianak plotted to revolt against the garrison there. Its commander, a young officer, got word of this and panicked, Without permission of his superiors, he seized the plotters and executed their ringleaders. The revolt was crushed and the garrison saved, but Daigo knew nothing of it until it was all over. The trial was very one-sided. It was evident that Daigo was free of guilt. But, in the true samurai spirit, Daigo was as loyal to his juniors as he was to his seniors. Even though evidence favourable to him could have been introduced, he would not allow it because it would have cast blame on others. On December 6th, 1947, Admiral Daigo was shot to death in the prison courtyard at Pontianak. He declined a blindfold, sang Kimigayo, our national anthem, loudly called out three banzai. For the emperor then calmly told the officer in charge he was ready. Bullets tore into his black suit and his grey flannel hat fell to the ground as he crumpled. It saddens me to think of that man and how much concern he had for all of his subordinates, including me. He was a good leader, much loved by all. The international military tribunals caused much argument. They will provide law students of all nations much food for study in coming centuries. Many legal experts, including Americans, claim that they had no basis in law. They were simply a matter of the victors laying down the law. Had he not inflicted humiliating defeats on top British officers in Malaya, I believe it very likely that our General Tomoyuki Yamashita would have lived to a ripe old age rather than suffer execution. Two justices of the US Supreme Court said that the international military tribunals pointed the way to future legal lynchings. Using the same principle of law applied by those tribunals, the Japanese could have legally beheaded General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, had we won, for their roles in the slaughter of helpless drowning men in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. Neither man was anywhere near the scene, of course, and I am sure that neither knew what was happening there when Allied planes and PT boats chopped Japanese survivors to bits. From the shipping business, I went into the sake business. I became a passable salesman, despite my original distaste for business. Like most officers of the Imperial Navy, I had little money, little interest in money, and little interest in the kinds of people who liked to accumulate it. My service pay had been ample for my modest needs, and my main concern had been defending my country, not getting rich. 
Hisako bore us two more children after the war. Our third son, Koichi, was born on January 20th, 1947, and our daughter Kumiko on September 29th, 1950. By the latter date, the Korean War had started, and MacArthur's headquarters decided that Japan should be rearmed for her own defence. In August 1950, our police reserve was formed, then reformed into a security force 20 months later, after the Japanese-American peace treaty ending the occupation was signed, a maritime security force was also set up at that time. On Aogachi 1, 1952, the National Security Agency was established to control both of these and, 23 months later, the Air Self-Defence Force came into being. The National Defence Agency was created then to control the air, ground and maritime self-defence forces. They bore these names because the constitution adopted by our government during the occupation forbade us to have offensive military power. During the summer of 1954, I was invited to join the Maritime Self-Defence Force. Experienced officers were needed to train the nucleus for its later expansion. The Etajima tradition does not easily die, and so I accepted. I served until 1963 before retiring from active duty and taking employment with a shipbuilding company. During part of my service, I commanded the Subwarina School, graduating 720 officers and men to crew a small but growing submarine fleet. When fine young men moved up the ranks to take command, my job was finished. I have seen a great deal of change since entering Etajima as a midshipman. China, once protected by America, came to hate her. Russia, once America's ally, became her chief adversary. Japan and Germany, once pitted in hate against the US, became her strongest trade and military partners. With a past so strange, who can predict the future? Of the 132 men who were graduated with me in the 59th class at Etajima, 15 were already dead when we went to war with America. Another 49 were killed in battle. 15 of us went into submarines, 12 had our own boats. Of the 12, only four survived the war. Morinaga became chief of staff for the Maritime Self-Defence Forces. Hashimoto built submarines for it at Kawasaki Heavy Industries, Kobe. And Toyomasu led the peaceful life of a high school principal at Tosu City in northern Honshu. People change and are always changing. Nobuo Fujita, who firebombed near Brookings, Oregon, was later a guest of that city's people. I was able, in 1958, to chat cheerfully with Mayor George Christopher of San Francisco of how I had nearly given his city a Christmas present from I-15 in 1941. The word Jap was an epithet on 100 million American tongues in 1941, but when a midget submarine was found on a reef near Pearl Harbor in 1960, the Americans raised and returned it to us with respectful ceremonies honouring the brave men who manned it. I have memories, some of them of the Sixth Fleet, which built the world's smallest, largest, slowest and fastest submarines, and had a small air force mounted on its decks. And I have my children, of whom I am so proud, and Hisako, of the gentle smile. Once a year we make a special visit to Tokyo and the Yasukuni Shrine, where the souls of Japan's war dead are venerated. There, with other former submarine men, I pray for my many departed shipmates and ask that war never again turn its ghastly face toward my beloved land.